Hi everyone! So a few months ago I put together a lecture here where I live on the history and the development of the violin. It's nice to be in a room speaking with people face to face about this topic, a topic I'm finding has way more of an audience than I ever could have predicted. I wish I could be in a room with all of you now, but I also appreciate how many more people I can reach this way. Alright, so the violin everyone's favorite topic. The violin as we know it was first made in the 1550s by Andrea Amati in Cremona, Italy. And this first modern instrument was actually commissioned by the Medici family. Now immediately I could go off in so many directions here, like really, the Medici's, or what makes a modern violin modern? But I'm going to take it back a step further here, namely what came before the violin. So during the Renaissance there were many different types of stringed instruments, but one of the most popular was the viol, which was the immediate predecessor to our modern stringed instruments. So the viol, before we go any further, had many different names and abbreviations. So when you heard the viol, viola da gamba, or just gamba, it's all actually referring to the same thing. Now we're going to straight away translate viola da gamba, which is Italian for literally leg viola. Incidentally, don't get this confused with the name viola, which is spelled the same way but actually means violet and doesn't refer to any instrument at all, though it was popularized, of course, by Shakespeare in Twelfth Night. Now, the viola da gamba wasn't the viola da gamba, but rather a family of instruments. So viol, viola da gamba, or just gamba, again, all interchangeable, something that confused me for the longest time. So just as we have the family of string instruments today, violin, viola, cello, double bass, there were at least four different sizes of gambas, which were not entirely standardized. A gamba, I should mention, was called such because it was often held between the legs similar to the cello today. However, modern cellos have the luxury of an end pin, that long, thin pin that comes out of the bottom of the instrument and stabilizes it against the ground. Now when this was invented in the 1830s, this was huge. This was a game changer on so many different levels. Viola da gamba and cellos after that were held tightly between the legs, like I mentioned, hence leg vial. But just imagine that for a second, squeezing an instrument between your legs for the entirety of a performance. Besides being just difficult to manage, it's also kind of painful. Obviously it's not a lost art and there are a lot of hacks surrounding early instruments to make them easier to play. It's very possible, just not as dare I say comfortable as the cello is today. So not only was the end pin a huge boon just for the instrument itself, but suddenly virtuosic repertoire was now on the table. Think of it, holding a big cumbersome instrument between your legs makes it difficult to get into the higher registers. With an end pin, suddenly the instrument is stationary, allowing the body to move around this already bulky instrument. A similar invention did the same wonders for the violin and the viola, also around the same time, but we will get to that later. Now, as I had mentioned, there were at least four different sizes of gambas, what we would call a consort. They usually had six strings and the tuning, which on orchestral instruments today is now done in fifths, and gambas was done in fourths with a major third in the center. However, that specific tuning wasn't actually fixed until well into the 16th century. It was a bit of a free-for-all. Any single person could take an instrument and tune it according to the personal teaching methods handed down to them. But to be able to play in groups or consorts, stable tuning became more and more necessary. Additionally, this helped create more canonic repertoire for the groups, pieces that could be played not just by one consort, but by many. Even though the first music had been printed on a press in 1457, that was the Mainz Psalter, it was still much more widespread to copy music by hand until well, well into the 1500s. So the unification of music and technologies also really affected exactly how these instruments were being tuned and played. So a great example of seeing and hearing the viol family in its entirety is actually by watching Monteverdi's Orfeo. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with this opera, this particular version of the Orfeo story, there are at least seven Orfeo operas, Monteverdi's Orfeo is the first opera to be really understood as a fully formed opera and is in fact the first earliest surviving opera that is still performed. It was composed in 1609. Now I'm obsessed with Jordi Saval's rendition of Orfeo. It's my 
favorite. You should really look it up on YouTube if you've never seen it. And it's fantastically dramatic. I mean, who can resist that sweeping entrance from the conductor or the roll of those Renaissance drums? It seriously gives me the chills every time. So, okay, on. When you do watch the clip, make sure to take a look at the string section. It's a fully formed consort of the six members of the viol family. You've got the standard four, as well as two contrabasse di viola, double basses, and two kit, or treble viols, which are also known as violini piccoli alla francese. And on that note, we're going to close out this video. There will be two more like this in the series. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to drop a comment, like, and subscribe. Until next time, cheers!